Good day and welcome to the Kojiko Inc. and Kojiko Communications Inc. Q1 2021 earnings conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Patrice Rimet, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Kojiko Inc. and Kojiko Communications Inc. Please go ahead, Mr. Rimet. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first quarter conference call, which uh, Philip Jeté and I will cover. So before we begin this call, as usual, I'd like to remind listeners that the call is subject to forward-looking statements, which can be found in our press releases issued yesterday. So I'll turn the call, the call over to Philip Jeté. Merci, Patrice, and good morning. Thank you for joining us to discuss the financial results of Kojiko Communication and Kojiko Inc. Let me first note that we are very pleased with the overall performance of Kojiko for the first quarter of 2021, as both our Canadian and American broadband segments showed strong increases in EBITDA compared to the first quarter of last year. This is largely explained by unique circumstances that were favorable to our business. During the quarter, we continued to experience some of the trends from the past quarters, higher demand from our residential high-speed internet products, and a deferral or reduction of certain expenses due to a more stable customer base as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In these unusual circumstances, we have decided to delay certain sales and marketing expenses to the second half of the year in both countries. As for our radio operations, they continue to be negatively impacted by the pandemic, but to a lesser extent than the previous quarter. Although we are pleased to report strong results in the current circumstances, we remain cautious in our management as uncertainties remain on the potential of human operating and financial impact of the pandemic. Starting with Kojiko Connections' recent initiatives, I am pleased to report that we closed the acquisition of Diri Telecom on December 14. The acquisition of the third largest cable operator in the province of Quebec enables Kojiko Connection to expand its activities in more than 200 municipalities in Quebec and adds approximately 100,000 customers to its base. This key strategic acquisition has increased our foothold in Quebec and is highly complementary in terms of geographic areas. We expect the, that the, DIRI, the acquisition of DIRI will generate superior growth relative to our current Canadian operations as we will pursue DIRI's network expansion and introduce Kojiko Connection product lineup. During the quarter, we continued to gradually roll out our IPTV service called Epico which is now offered in approximately 85% of our Canadian footprint. We are planning to launch a marketing campaign next week, which will allow us to attract new customers and upsell a portion of our current customer base. Epico provides many benefits, such as customization settings for customers, access to the Google Play Store, integration with OTT platforms, a Wi-Fi connection, self-installation capabilities, and an overall lower delivery cost. We have continued to be active in bidding for network expansion projects as part of various government-sponsored programs aim at providing high-speed internet to unserved and underserved areas. Kojiko was awarded a total of 25 projects in Quebec and Ontario, including four projects for Diri Telecom since the programs were launched. Furthermore, we have submitted more than 100 additional projects, which are currently being reviewed. With deep roots in regions and rural communities in Ontario and Quebec, Kojiko is at the forefront of solving the connectivity challenges faced by consumers and businesses in underserved and unserved areas. With these network expansions, we will continue to help close the gap in digital access and extend our regional high-speed internet coverage. 
Finally, as we await the CRTC's conclusion on its mobile wireless services review, we continue to forge ahead with our plan to enter the mobile services market aim at providing more choice to Canadian customers in the regions we serve. Now, turning to the key initiatives at Atlantic Broadband, the main focus in the last quarter has been to put in place a new offer strategy which is simple, transparent, and puts broadband at the center of the customer experience. We expect our new broadband first offer strategy to increase customer experience and satisfaction while improving both customer lifetime value and contribution margins. The broadband first offer is currently in market and will be fully launched across the footprint during the second quarter. The related new pricing strategy resolve around the internet offering and put less emphasis on bundling than in the previous construct. Customers will still have access to the full product lineup, but be incentivized to add more services through modular pricing. However, the video product, which still face sizable cost increases, will be priced in line with the cost of delivery and ensure that it continues to contribute to earnings in the long term. For this reason, it will generally not longer be offered to new customers as a standalone product, except for some bulk contract with higher bundling potential. With the increasing number of connected devices at home, it is essential to have a strong Wi-Fi customer experience, which means a stable network working well across the home and easy to set up and modify. Atlantic Broadband has therefore upgraded its Wi-Fi product and as announced on January 11th, the launch of a new and enhanced Wi-Fi solution. This new solution integrates a leading edge customer facing application, including parental controls and network optimization, while facilitating initial installation and providing remote assistance and diagnostics for pro proactive network maintenance. The solution also enables seamless integration of network extenders, which can be added as needed depending of the, on the size of the home. The Wi-Fi experience improvement is also planned to be launched at Kojiko Connection shortly. As for Kojiko Media, its financial performance was better than expected with a lower decline in revenue relative to the last quarter and improve a bit DA compared to the same quarter last year as we have been maintaining our financial discipline given the continued impact of the pandemic on the advertising market. Regarding recent changes to our executive team, I am pleased to announce that Zuer Mansurati has joined the Kojiko Group at the end of November as Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer. Zuer has nearly three decades of experience in the telecommunication industry, several executive positions, planning and leading major broadband network implementation. Zuer's years of experience in telecommunication combined with his drive, leadership and collaboration skills will be instrumental in furthering Kojiko's technology and innovation strategy. I will now let Patrice discuss our financial results. So thank you, Philip. Uh, for the quarter, uh, revenue at Kojiko Communications is up 5.7% and EBITDA 10.5% in constant currency when compared to the previous year. This was driven by EBITDA growth of 8.9% at Kojiko Connection and 14.3% at Atlantic Broadband. So consolidated revenue reached 619 million and EBITDA reached 311 million, generating a margin of 50.3%. Free cash flow is also increased by 36.9% in constant currency 
The increase is mainly due to higher EBITDA, but also a decline in capital expenditures, financial expenses, and current income tax. Capital intensity in the quarter was 18.8%, which is slightly lower than the 20% target we have for the full year. Quarterly dividend has been reconfirmed at uh, 64 cents for Kojiko Communication, and now I'll discuss the components of it. At Kojiko Connection in Canada, revenue has increased by 2.2% relative to the same quarter last year, mainly due to the cumulative effects of sustained demand for residential high-speed internet since the beginning of the pandemic, a better product mix, and rate increases implemented for certain services. Kojoko Connections EBITDA increased by 8.9% as a result of increased revenue and the decline in operating expenses. Now, the decline in OPEX is due partially to lower sales and marketing activity deferred to the second half of the year in the context of the pandemic and lower compensation expenses resulting from an operational optimization program implemented during the fourth quarter of last year. The broadband customer additions were slightly lower than usual in the quarter, but at higher ARPUs due to a better product mix. The video product losses were in line with historical trends. And finally, the phone losses were also in line with historical trends, except that last year had an unusual addition due to a bundling strategy used at the time. At Atlantic Broadband, revenue and constant currency increased by 9.8% in the first quarter compared to last year, while EBITDA increased by 14.3%. If we exclude the Thames Valley acquisition impact, revenue and EBITDA would have grown by 8.2 and 12.8% respectively. Organic revenue growth comes mainly from residential and business internet service customer additions throughout the pandemic rate increases implemented for certain services, and increased political advertising revenue related to the United States presidential election. Superior organic EBITDA growth was mainly due to revenue increasing at a greater pace than operating expenses. Similar to Kojiko Connection, Atlantic Broadband deferred certain sales and marketing expenses to the second half of the year, primarily due to the COVID-19 situation. Also note that video contract cost increases normally take effect on January 1st and will be fully reflected in the second quarter results. Atlantic Broadband had very strong customer uh, additions uh, with 12,000 new internet customers and has continued to modestly grow video and uh, phone customers as well for a third quarter in a row, partially thanks to new Florida bulk residential customer activations which were stronger than usual during the quarter. Let us now take a look at Kojiko Inc. Uh, In the first quarter, consolidated revenue increased by 4.3% and EBITDA by 10.4% in constant currency. While the broadband business had strong results, the media business continued to be impacted by the pandemic due to certain segments of the retail industry reducing advertising budgets. Revenue related to the radio operations decreased by 13% uh, versus last year in the first quarter. However, it is an improvement from the last quarter, the previous quarter, Q4, uh, where we had a decrease of 29% year over year. We will continue to monitor the situation closely in the coming quarters as uncertainty remains for the economy in general and more specifically for certain categories of advertising with Uh, operations being in lockdown at the moment. Finally, the quarterly dividend has been reconfirmed for Kojiko Inc. at 54.5 cents per share. I will now discuss guidelines. Kojiko Communication uh, has revised its guidelines for the full year to reflect the daily telecom acquisition, which closed on December 14th, and the stronger than expected first quarter results, especially at Atlantic Broadband. On a constant currency basis, we do expect mid to high single digit percentage growth in consolidated revenue and EBITDA for fiscal 2021. The acquisition of Daily Telecom is expected to have a positive impact of approximately 3% on both revenue and EBITDA. Now, underlying those guidelines, 
at a critical connection. We do expect to achieve mid to high single digit growth in revenue and EBITDA for the year, which is a combination of the daily acquisition and low single digit organic growth. Note that EBITDA is expected to gradually decline in terms of growth year over year, decline uh, over the next three quarters as sales and marketing costs ramp up in the balance of the year. And certain cost savings related to the pandemic are expected to decline in the second half of the year. Also note that last year's comparative period in 2020 in the last two quarters of the year was especially strong. At Atlantic Broadband, we expect mid to high single digit growth in revenue and EBITDA resulting from strong residential and business sectors and the continued expansion in Florida. Similar to Kojiko Connection, Atlantic Broadband's growth should gradually decline over the next three quarters as a result of sales and marketing costs ramping up, internet growth gradually returning to pre-pandemic levels, and having the results of the Thames Valley acquisition in the comparative period for Q3 and Q4. On a consolidated basis, capital intensity is expected to remain at 20%, and free cash flow on a constant currency basis is expected to grow at a low double digit percentage. As for Kojiko Inc., we do expect in constant currency mid to high single digit growth in revenue and EBITDA and a high single digit percentage growth in free cash flow. I will now turn to Philip for concluding remarks. Thank you, Patrice. <clears throat> On the basis of a strong first quarter, fiscal year 2021 looks very promising despite the unfavorable economic impacts related to the pandemic, as we will continue to manage our costs closely and pursue profitable growth through various organic initiatives and acquisitions when possible. Pro forma, the Deary Telecom acquisition. Our 2.5 times net leverage leaves ample room for other acquisitions and share buybacks. Through to our commitment to bring new services and competitive choices to our communities, especially in underserved regions, we remain engaged in launching a mobile wireless service in the regions we serve. If the regulatory conditions are conducive to our entry in the market and are meeting our financial return objectives. Finally, I would like to highlight how proud I am that we achieve or surpass essentially all of our corporate social responsibilities targets in the last fiscal year. We have been a trusted and reliable partner for our customers in this challenging environment, and we have contributed to the development of our employees in addition to surpassing our gender diversity objective. Furthermore, we have taken part in developing our communities surpassing our target donations, and have efficiently managed our environmental footprint by reducing more GHG emissions than our target. Finally, we have maintained a sound culture and a strong corporate governance as we remain in the top tier of family-controlled publicly listed Canadian companies as ranked by the Globe and Mail board game. And now we will be happy to answer your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Your first question comes from Vince Valentini from TD Securities. Please go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, congratulations on these uh, strong first quarter results. Um, first, uh, Patrice, probably, can you flesh out a bit more of the deferred marketing costs that you're, you're talking about, uh, both in, in terms of quantity, if you can, are we talking $5 million or $10 million that you expect to uh, catch up on spending in, in the next three quarters? And also in terms of timing, I, I assume it starts in the second quarter if your, your, your launch of IPTV goes, goes more public starting next week. I assume the costs uh, ramp up uh, at that time. So that, that's question number one. Number two, um, just uh, more broadly on on allocation of capital and and share buybacks um, with 
your free cash flow guidance going up pretty substantially to uh, low double digits from low single digit growth for this year. Um, and your balance sheet's obviously still pretty strong even after paying for dairy. Is there any consideration to uh, increasing the, the share buyback program, either the NCIB uh, getting more active or, or perhaps even a, a substantial issue would be? Thank you. Great. So good morning, Vince. Uh, yeah, so on the OPEX uh, side, um, the, um, so if we look, this is a story for both uh, countries for different reasons. Um, what happened is the, uh, the COVID situation has slowed down the number of uh, connections and disconnections. And uh, for that reason, we thought it was wiser to defer some of these expenses as the economy gets back to uh, normal in the back end. So you should expect that there's going to be more in Q2, but especially more than that in Q3 and Q4. It would be difficult to quantify uh, what it is, uh, because actually even the, the exact spending by quarter is not fully determined yet. And what we would have normally spent uh, this quarter uh, without COVID is uh, undetermined as well. So that's why we prefer uh, referring to uh, to yearly guidance. And uh, we provided the we were a bit more precise than usual on uh, on ABB and CCX, uh, our Kajiko connection, um, to uh, help you uh, uh, with this. So difficult to quantify more than this, but I would say our, our ramp up throughout the year. You'll, uh, you also know that our Q4 ends with the back to school. Uh, so that's normally a period where there's more activity. On the uh, capital allocation, uh, we are absolutely uh, in favor of uh, buying back shares. We have been fairly active, uh, I would say, over the past year, uh, except in the fall, uh, given the circumstances that uh, you know well, we were advised to uh, not buy shares, so that's why you, you did not see anything. Uh, but we are planning to be active uh, in the future in terms of buying back shares. Uh, normally, an NCIB uh, allows for uh, significant uh, capacity. Our program allows for up to 10% uh, of the float. And uh, given that we haven't bought in a couple of months, uh, we have ample capacity in that program. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jérôme Dubré from Desjardins. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Thanks for taking my question. Um, we've seen a strong acceleration uh, in U.S. growth. Uh, can you please break down ro what proportion of this uh, of this growth is due to political ads, uh, rates increase, and maybe subscriber? We can uh, calculate it, but uh, with the other two, please. Yeah, the political ads are uh, are. This is something we don't uh, control. Obviously, it depends on the on the, on the agenda and. Uh, uh, it did add about 1% to revenue in the quarter versus last year, and about 2% to EBITDA. Uh, this goes directly uh, down to the EBITDA line because there's no cost uh, attached to it. Um, now, in terms of uh, price increases, subscriber increases, and also a better product mix as we've been able to sell uh, higher packages than, uh, than usual, I would say it's a mix of all three. Uh, there's a, there's not necessarily one element that uh, that represents 80% of it. So it's a it's a mix. Thanks. And um, regarding the acceleration in broadband uh, net additions in the U.S., I'm just trying to understand if this could impact the the seasonality of future net ads. Uh, do you think there's a lot of uh, summer homes? Maybe uh, should we expect more seasonal disconnections going forward? Well, when we bought Metrocast, uh, there was a bit of adjustment in the year-over-year -year comparison, but we're past that now, uh, so I would not uh, assume anything major. You should note, however, that uh, Florida was stronger than usual in terms of, uh, of new, uh, uh, I would say, lighting up of the bulk uh, contracts. Uh, th these contracts take, take a bit of time between selling, building, and lighting up uh, the building. Um, so both in the, in the video and HSI, uh, Florida has uh, added about three to four thousand PSUs. So that's for both video and, uh, and HSI. Um, and <clears throat> so it's been a bit more spotty than usual, but still very good performance on uh, on HSI. Besides this, so going forward, 
uh, we do expect to have uh, better performance uh, uh, in the U.S. in terms of uh, PSC auditions than usual given the, the, the COVID uh, situation. Thank you. Your next question comes from Matthew Griffith from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, hi, thanks for taking the question. I wanted to ask about the uh, Atlantic Broadband and the uh, the broadband first uh, strategy, which seems like a, a little bit of a pivot. I think previously um, there was a focus on uh, on the bundle, um, and I was just wondering what you're seeing in the U.S. that you know made you uh, shift like this, and um, you know what you hope the uh, the impact. Uh, will be um, going forward, um, and maybe separately uh, on the integration of dairy. Uh, if you could lay out some milestones um, that you're expecting um, in the integration, whether it's you know uh, I'm thinking of the realization of costs that you may have to incur uh, up front, um, and maybe the realization of synergies as you go through the year. Anything you can kind of talk about how the integration is, is expected to play out. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. It's Philippe. Um, I will address the broadband first. Uh, Patrice will add more on Diri. Uh, to, um, to, to, to summarize uh, the, the change or the shift that is happening in the uh, market, it, it's in part driven by the technology change. Video was delivered on dedicated video networks, as we all know in the past, and now video is actually moving as an IP application or, or an IP service um, over the top of these uh, broadband, faster and more quality broadband networks that we've been building everywhere. So not only broadband to connect to the high-speed internet, is um, it, there, there's a, a strong increase there, but video consumption on top of broadband uh, is becoming more and more popular. So that will certainly um, create a, a world where legacy video will remain for a long time as uh, it winds down, it will take time, but the new video markets are mostly broadband driven. So that's why we're shifting uh, to a broadband first, uh, making sure we can install fast and high quality networks as well as Wi-Fi inside the home uh, to make sure that every device, every laptop, every uh, iPad, uh, every um, connected device inside the home, including the video devices, uh, benefit from a strong Wi-Fi platform. So that's, that's the shift that is happening and that we're uh, staying uh, ahead of. Now for Diri. Uh, for Derry, actually, we uh, so we closed about a month ago, um, and things are going well. Uh, obviously, when we make acquisitions like this, there's an integration of the teams uh, uh, reporting line, so that's uh, been done already. Uh, there's also uh, integration of uh, systems, which uh, takes a bit more time, so that's going to be uh, a bit later in the year. Uh, and uh, we uh, we do expect to generate additional revenues from uh, bringing the Kojiko product lineup to uh, Diri, uh, including on the business side. Uh, so this uh, will start uh, soon. And uh, there's cost synergies on procurement uh, that is already in motion. So I would say uh, I would expect that um, that uh, all these things will fall into place throughout the year. That was the uh, that was the plan initially. Uh, and uh, starting uh, next year, we're going to be in a normal mode of operation. Thanks. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one. Your next question comes from Jeff Sam from Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. I uh, hope you guys are all well. Um, I want to follow up on the U.S. Uh, broadband only um, I understand the rationale, and I'm wondering what you think that move will have uh, the impact on margins, um, because we've seen other cable companies, smaller ones, um, secondary and secondary markets that are focused on broadband-only strategy, and we've seen pretty significant margin expansion. Your ABB 
segment has about 45%. And I mean, 50% margins are not unreasonable to think about. So I'm wondering if you can comment there um, in terms of the medium longer term impact. The second question is on Canada. Um, and just to follow up on Philippe, your comments about entering the wireless market, um, leaving spectrum and leaving regulatory aside, from an operational perspective, I just want to hear your thoughts or your take on the readiness of Kojiko to enter the market. Um, specifically, when we talk about things like billing systems to handle wireless customers, um, whether you plan to invest in your own core, um, retail locations, I wonder if you can just touch on that maybe in a general sense about the potential cost impact when and if you do decide to enter as a wireless uh, player. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'll just um, touch briefly on uh, video uh, broadband margins. Uh, Pat Patrice can compliment, and I will answer your wireless question. So on the shift to broadband, uh, there's definitely an increase in uh, in margins there. We all know the uh, the contribution margins of broadband is good. Um, and we, uh, as customers, will shift from a legacy video network delivery and legacy CPEs as well that are very costly uh, to the new ones, uh, IP base, um, on the broadband fiber optic networks that we're building. Uh, there will be an improvement uh, over time there. So that's, uh, that's a gain. Now, on the wireless side, um, it's uh, still too soon uh, with uh, absence of um, uh, decisions from the CRTC uh, and, and other decisions that uh, Industry Canada could, um, could, could make and announce in uh, the near-term future uh, to, 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 to disclose our go-to-market strategy. But let me say this. The, 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 on the adding a wireless, a mobile wireless layer to our networks in the operating areas, uh, the current operating areas. We have ample capacity. Uh, the, the, the transport of all these, um, uh, of, of all the uh, the signals can be can be made very easily. We simply have to add the uh, radio access network. Uh, the core, in terms of transport, is already built. It is our it is feeding our broadband strategy today. Uh, we have a number of systems that were upgraded uh, in recent years that could handle easily things like uh, commissioning um, and, and billing. Uh, there is a small, very small addition to the, to the core network that we need to make. We know exactly what to do um, and how to do it. Now, as to the model for the go-to-market that we will choose, uh, I've said it many times uh, we will bring more competition to the marketplace with a, um, a leading edge uh, market in terms of go to market so i won't ex expand more for obvious competitive reasons at this point but we are first and foremost expecting the crtc and i said to um, to address the barriers to entry for regional players like kojiko uh, throughout canada so back to margins with Patrice. Yeah, so um, basically what uh, our strategy in the U.S. is more an evolution rather than a break from what we've been doing in the past. Obviously, over time, we've been migrating towards, uh, like the whole industry, having the broadband as the key product. Um, but the way we're restructuring uh, our go-to-market approach, uh, it's really going to be focused. It's going to be more visible than it used to. So it's more of an evolution. And as Philip said, with new tools as well, new, better devices in the home to provide a better service from a broadband standpoint. That being said, um, we, uh, we did generate about 45% in margin last year. We would expect margin to increase a little bit this year. Um, it's uh, our, our goal is to remain profitable and generate free cash flow on video, which we're doing today. And as we move into an IP mode eventually, uh, we're not there yet in the U.S., uh, this will help decrease costs as well and make sure that we have a viable uh, and profitable uh, video product. So 
difficult to say where we'll be in the future, uh, but we would rather have a gradual increase in margins over a good revenue base uh, than accelerate uh, margins on a declining revenue base on video. So that's uh, that's the goal at, the, at this point. So maybe Thanks for the color. We, we, well, maybe we could just uh, simply add as well as the CPE are uh, are costing far less with IP on IP and broadband networks. The capex savings there will also uh, be reused for network expansion. So we will grow these broadband networks and the video expenditures will decline. Great, thank you. Your last question comes from Tim Casey from BMO. Please go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, give us, given, uh, uh, you know, as you say, it's an evolution into broadband, would, um, would you be willing to share um, any numbers on what the ARPU levels you're getting out of broadband in both territories? And a second, just a, a point of clarification, Patrice, um, you, you said prices uh, start to come in in January, I believe, in the U.S. Could you just um, review for us the magnitude of price increases, uh, I guess, on both sides of the border and when they would kick in? Thank you. Okay. Um, let me start with the last one. So on uh, video price increases, uh, we normally sign multi-year contracts. So usually they're two or three year contracts. And um, there's some years that are more lumpy than others. Um, this year, there's a bit more uh, than last year, starting in uh, January 1st. It's not all the contracts, it's a portion of them. And in Canada, it's a bit more normal. Um, overall, in both countries, uh, on a per customer basis, we expect mid uh, single digit increase in uh, video cost. It used to be higher than this in the US. It used to be double, low double digit at one point. Um, and so that's why we're uh, uh, managing this uh, closely. Uh, sometimes we have to make choices also on the, on the video programming that we carry to make sure that the channels we carry are profitable and we can generate the revenue on. So that, that would give you a, a view of it. So you should not expect a, a, a great increase, uh, or, or, uh, but, but even last year, uh, a number of programs did uh, kick in on, uh, on Jan 1st. Now we don't uh, segregate our, our revenue by, uh, or our, our pool by product. Uh, so that's not really something I could comment on at this point. Uh, however, with the new strategy, which is early days, we have it in market right now, uh, and we've had it uh, um, in a, in a non-promoted uh, non -promoted fashion. So it's uh, it's small scale, just to test the water. It's going well, and we've been able to increase our pools, especially on the broadband side, uh, so far for with what we have. So we'll be able to talk more to that uh, once we're. Uh, at a larger scale in market and uh, comment on what we're seeing. Thank you. And we do have a follow-up from Vince Valentini from TD Securities. Please go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, thanks for getting me back in. Um, a couple of things we haven't addressed, uh, Patrice, the uh, timing of your own rate increases to customers as opposed to the, the programming costs increases that you're absorbing. Uh, I think some of that stuff got uh, d delayed uh, because of the pandemic over the past 12 months. Can you just level set us and remind us when the last price increases were and what, what the most likely schedule is for the next round? Uh, and then the other uh, question just uh, for, for Philippe, if, if you want, is uh, uh, the outlook for acquisitions in the U.S. Uh, any update there on how the pipeline looks of of targets that could become available? Is, is, are things, uh, is there much for sale? Are prices still pretty high? Do you have any hopes that something might get done in the next six to 12 months? That'd be great, thanks. Okay, so on the price increases, we did uh, uh, have some uh, price increases on some products in Ontario in uh, June, and we had some in Quebec in uh, starting in November. Uh, overall, if you take uh, the two of them, it's about 3% on an annual basis, and that is, does include video as well. 
so we need to uh, obviously increase prices on our our product to uh, match inflation and and then uh, we need to be able to uh, maintain margins on uh, on video so that uh, about three percent in the US uh, it was about four uh, percent um, and the price increases were done in September uh, as to the future, um, it's something we generally don't comment on because we prefer announcing it to our customers at the same time. And, um, and these decisions uh, vary during the year, especially during COVID. As you pointed out, we did uh, slow down the uh, price increases by a number of months to uh, help our customers. Um, so we'll, we'll, see how, we'll have to see how this uh, plays out in the future. But uh, I would not necessarily assume anything uh, unusual uh, going forward. For M&A uh, in the U.S., we continue to view the um, a sizable potential in the U.S. market. There's a number of companies still between uh, 30 to 40, maybe a little bit more. But the pandemic has certainly had a... Uh, an effect there. Uh, conversations uh, are taking place, but uh, negotiations have been slowed down. So we continue to be uh, optimistic. Uh, we continue to work very hard on acquisitions. Um, and uh, you've seen that uh, we've closed uh, three in the, in the past year. We would like to do uh, more than that, but um, we have to be we are good partners, but we need to, uh, to take the time it takes to do it well and do it right. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to the presenters for any closing remarks. Okay, well, thanks uh, for participating today. We're going to be back with uh, the second quarter results in April, and feel free to call us if you have any questions in, in the meantime. Thank you. Have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.